Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. This is Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, verses 14 and 15, and verses 21 through 23. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you have any traditions or rituals that are precious to you? For example, is it a tradition in your family to hold hands when you say grace before a meal? Do you maybe have a tradition of there's this shirt you always got to wear when your favorite team plays. Do you maybe have a tradition of having pancakes every Saturday? Because that's when you have time to make them. Do you have a tradition? Lots of people do. You, you take a picture on the first day of school, and then you have a whole series of pictures to look back on over the years of your child or your grandchild as they grow. Well, one tradition I have is that every year I love to reread the classic little book, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever, by Barbara Robinson, published in 1972. Has anybody ever read that book? Best Christmas Pageant Ever? Okay, excellent. So you remember that the story begins like this. The Herdmans were absolutely the worst kids in the history of the world. They lied and stole and smoked cigars, even the girls, and talked dirty and hit little kids and cussed their teachers and took the name of the Lord in vain and set fire to Fred Shoemaker's old broken down tool house. They were just so all around awful, you could hardly believe they were real. Ralph, Imogene, Leroy, Claude, Ollie, and Gladys. And then one day, all six kids show up at church because they've heard there are refreshments. And they end up volunteering for all the main roles in the church's annual Christmas pageant. Mary, Joseph, the three wise men, and the angel of the Lord. Everyone is horrified by this, but what can they do? None of the other children dare to volunteer for fear that the herdmans will beat them up if they do. So rehearsals begin, and the suspense and the humor comes from all the different ways that these thoroughly unrepentant children find to disrupt the rules and their traditions 
of this little church and its Christmas pageant. And that story came to mind for me this week as I reflected on this passage from the Gospel of Mark about a time when Jesus gets questioned yet again by some Pharisees and scribes who were the religious professionals of that time. Why, they ask him, do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders but eat with defiled hands? It's important to note that they are not talking about good hygiene. They're talking about a religious ritual, something they do that sets them apart from everybody else. Thoroughly washing their hands doesn't mean they're scrubbing them with lots of soap and, and warm water for 30 seconds. It simply means washing up to the elbow. The disciples' hands are defiled not in the sense that they're visibly dirty, but in the sense that they have not been ceremonially washed, which, you know, that's kind of hard to do with water in such short supply anyway. When Jesus responds to the Pharisees, he's sharp with them, calling them hypocrites. And maybe that's to be expected. He and the disciples have just recently fed 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish. When they tried to cross to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to get a break, they're instantly mobbed by all these people who want Jesus to heal their loved ones. So here they are, having done all these wonderful things to demonstrate the kingdom of God for people, and the Pharisees are picking on them about washing their hands. It's hard for us maybe to appreciate what a big deal this was, because ceremonial washing is just not part of the things we do today to practice our faith. So one way to begin to relate to the Pharisees a little bit better might be to think for a moment about some of the symbols and rituals we have here in the United States of America, like our, our flag and the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. And when people don't show those things the respect that we believe they deserve, we have strong feelings about that, don't we? Just as a flag is a symbol that points to a bigger reality, so was the washing of hands for Jews in Jesus' time. It was one of many customs that reminded them of who they were and whose they were, the holy people of God. Jesus never says, stop washing your hands never says that. He does say, let's take another look at that. Let's not confuse the ritual with the deeper reality that it represents. When the ritual itself becomes the focus, not what it points to, we have lost our way. So Jesus has literally a come to Jesus moment where he calls everyone together, not just the Pharisees who've asked the question, not just the disciples, but the whole crowd, because that's how important this is. And he says, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. And then our reading from the lectionary skips over the part where the disciples follow Jesus as he leaves the crowd, and when they all get home, they say, huh? So Jesus does some follow-up teaching with them, listing 12 different evil actions and attitudes that have their origins in the human heart. These things, theft and murder and slander, these defile the person who does them far more than eating with ceremonially unclean hands. External things cannot make us dirty. Clothes can't do it. Piercings and tattoos can't do it. Nor can any kind of food. The unwelcome touch of another person 
defiles only the one doing the touching, not the one being touched against their will, which some of us may need to hear if we've ever been a victim of any kind of physical violence or sexual abuse. It is the stuff we do and say that makes us clean or unclean, and that is what Jesus does not want us to lose sight of. A tradition like hand washing is only valuable as far as it directs our hearts to God. When the tradition itself becomes the priority, it loses its value. In 1999, I've told this story before, but it's been a real long time. I hosted Thanksgiving dinner in Southern California for my in-laws at the time. And it was usually just about a dozen of us, but that particular year, 1999, there were a number of relatives visiting from Algeria, since my sister-in-law had married a man from Algeria. And I learned I would be hosting a much larger and more diverse group for Thanksgiving than I originally planned. And being a lot younger and dumber back then, I remember feeling disappointed that I couldn't just set one nice, big, pretty table for Thanksgiving. I was going to have to, the china wasn't going to match. We were going to have to use paper plates. There were going to have to be multiple tables, and people would have to sit on the couch. And I remember the resentment I felt when a well-meaning guest brought a fluffy yellow dessert with bananas in it, which did not fit at all with the elegant, traditional Thanksgiving menu I had in my mind. And the funny thing is, of course, you've already seen this coming, Thanksgiving is a distinctly American holiday. And what better celebration could there be, could there possibly be, than to joyfully welcome guests from another culture who were genuinely excited to experience an American Thanksgiving. What better way to remember the first Thanksgiving than to share foods from different cultures? But I couldn't see that at the time because I was so focused on my narrow vision of what a happy Thanksgiving ought to be. Today, I would be thrilled to host a meal like the one I failed to appreciate back in 1999. We'll have our own special meal today when we celebrate the sacrament of communion. When we do this, I hope that those of you who are worshiping online will pause and go get some some form of bread, some form of juice, whatever you have, and celebrate the Lord's Supper along with all of us who are here today When we do this, it's not the kind of bread that matters. It is not the kind of cup or what is in it that matters. It's not the way we serve the elements. Whether you come forward or we bring them to you or you just participate virtually online. For a long time, there was a tradition in the Presbyterian Church that only ministers of the Word and Sacrament were authorized to administer the Sacrament of Communion, but that has changed to include commissioned ruling elders in their place of ministry. And this tradition will keep changing as both ministers and commissioned ruling elders get harder and harder to find. And I think that's a good thing, because... The words of institution don't take on special power simply because someone with a seminary degree says them. The words and the elements and the order in which we do things are there to help point us to the deeper reality that Christ was born, Christ died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. It isn't the minister saying the right words, although that's important, that makes it communion. It is all of us gathered here today doing this to remember Jesus. It's what's in our hearts as we eat the bread and drink the cup and remember. What matters is that we are right here, right now, 
present to each other and open to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. So if you're wondering, well, where's the good news in today's scripture reading? Maybe we can hear it in the way Jesus challenges us to examine the rituals and traditions we hold dear, especially the ones that get us all riled up if someone doesn't do it right. Maybe some traditions no longer serve us very well, and we can let them go. Maybe we will realize them, that some of them are so precious that they are worth fighting for and worth holding on to for the way they draw our hearts closer to God and each other. And maybe some of them just need a little bit of tweaking. In the best Christmas pageant ever, the terrible Herdman kids end up making the pageant the best one ever. Not by doing everything right, but by breaking with tradition in order to act from their hearts. Like when Leroy, Claude, and Ollie, as the wise men, give the baby Jesus the giant ham from their Christmas basket. Or when Imogene as Mary suddenly is hit by the meaning of Christmas in the middle of silent night and begins to cry right there on the chancel. May God grant us the grace to cherish those traditions that bring us closer to God, the strength to let go of those that no longer serve us, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen.